So uh, today I'm going to talk about the Square Kilometre Array. Um, my boss would call it the world's largest radio telescope, but I in fact call it the world's largest streaming data processor. Okay. We agree to differ on this uh, minor subtlety. Um, the first part of the talk I'll give you an update on, on what we do in Cambridge in terms of high performance computing, where the centre's going. And then we'll give a, a broad overview of the SKA from a kind of a high level. And then we'll delve down into the consortium that's concerned with building the sensor, the science data processor. And we'll look at two work, package in the, two work packages in there that I run. Okay, so it's pretty, a uh, little bit high level and then we delve down into some work packages. So just my normal leading slide about the University of Cambridge. Obviously we all know that Cambridge is one of the leading teaching and research universities in the world. And we're consistently ranked within the top three, I guess. We kind of move up and down depending on how you do the ranking. We have an annual income of about 1.2 billion pounds. 40% of that research, of that money is spent on research. So we have one of the largest research budgets within the UK HE sector. We have 17,000 students and 9,000 staff. Obviously that's a very high staff student ratio because most of those staff are involved in research. Okay. But outside of Cambridge, it's the university itself, there is a, is a major technology halo that sits around the, the city. So there are 1,500 technology companies within the surrounding science parks that generate around 12 billion pounds annual revenue and employ 53,000 staff. So actually the technology halo itself is now kind of bigger than the university. And uh, the High Performance Computing Service has a mandate to provide research computing services to the university and that wider technology community within the city. And we're now sp spinning up infrastructure to support that technology halo. So if you look at the activity domains that I'm focused on currently, there are four, four domains. So obviously my day job is, is this segment here, where we provide a, a typical university HPC service focused at driving the discovery process across the university. Okay, so that's pretty, pretty typical. Um, we have a commercial activity and we're, we're, we're spun out a vehicle we call CORE to sell HPC services to the industrial sector. I'll talk a little bit about that later. We're now involved in our own research and development programs, so we take research grant income and we undertake HPC research activities normally in partnership with an academic. And we have a, an HPC solution centre that's funded by Dell, and I'll, I'll talk about that as well. <coughs> so if you just look at our, our vital statistics, we have over a thousand users today from about 35 different departments across the university. And currently we have around 900, I guess, Dell servers providing about 450 teraflops of sustained performance. And these are set up into three systems. We have an old, uh, our oldest system is a Dell Westmere system. This has been decommissioned now. And we're sending that to Africa as a training system. So that's, oops. This has been decommissioned and sent to Africa as a training system. Our main workhorse is 600 nodes of uh, Sandy Bridge with Metalox FDR. That was quite a large cluster when it was first installed. And our latest system is a, a GPU testbed. This was funded partly by the SKA. This is quite an interesting system in that the network has been designed to exploit GPU Direct. So each GPU Direct is direct, each GPU card is directly attached to uh, an Infinity Band card on the same I/O hub. So 100, 128 nodes. Each node has two. NVIDIA cards, each node has two Mellanox cards, and that allows GPU functionality. And DK will talk about that. He's been on the system with his guys and uh, has done a lot of interesting work exploiting GPU Direct, so you'll see about that later on in the, in the show. But it really starts to show that GPU clusters can be parallelly efficient. If you, if you put your mind at it, the synthetics look very good for parallel applications on GPU clusters if you do this correctly. Okay, We designed it for energy efficiency and it reached number two in the last Green 500 last year. 
which was quite interesting. And at that time, it was the most efficient air-cooled supercomputer because we didn't dip ours in oil because I do not like oily engineers. Engineers are messy at the best of times. If you give them vats of oil to play with, it's just a recipe for disaster. I won't, I won't have it personally, but some people like oily engineers. It's not my thing. And we have a lot of storage, lots of base storage, obviously. Okay, so this is just a one slide to talk about this entity called Core. The UK government at the moment is very keen on this idea of investing in public sector infrastructure, as long as that infrastructure also helps drive the economy. Okay, so they want to have their cake and eat it. And we all know that that is highly possible. So they invest in public sector infrastructure. We open that infrastructure up under a pay-per-use model. Lots of companies jump on, become successful, generate growth, and we reinvest that back into the infrastructure. And we've been working like this for a long time anyway because of our cost model. We run as a cost centre, so I have to charge my academics for use anyway. So we run as a, as a cost centre, and we've been selling infrastructure to industry for some time. But now the government is really keen on, on, on accelerating this process, and we find it quite useful. About 30% about of our income comes from this route. Okay. And it's good income because it has margin in it, and I can spend it on what I like. Whereas government money is kind of tagged to specific function. Whereas this money I can use buying beer for my guys. Which they like. <laughs> so, this is a very successful activity of ours. We've been running this now for five years. So we've been a Dell Solution Center for the last five years. We get kind of block funding from Dell to act as an HPC integration lab for them, and we generate various solutions which we open up to the community and publish a lot of white papers on it. So this is a long-term relationship with Dell, which has been successful for us and successful for Dell. So I'm just going to list some of our flagship projects just to give you a flavor. I won't, I won't dwell on them for very long. So we're also part of a, a national service called DIRAC. This is funded by one of our funding agencies called STFC. 50% of our infrastructure is funded through this route. So we open up the infrastructure for non-Cambridge academics who receive funding from STFC. One of our large user communities is the UK QCD Consortium. And of course, these guys can eat as much processing power as you give them. Right? They, are, they are just very hungry for, uh, for resources. We're currently on the Dirac 2 system. It's the second iteration of Dirac. Next year we'll see Dirac 3 funding, so there's a big up, uptick in funding because the UK government are still providing large capital funds. And so next year we'll be expanding this dramatically with a focus on data. So more data-centric HPC, how we can have very large data throughputs through the system. That will come out mid next year. So we're in NVIDIA, Centre of Excellence. I think we were the first Centre of Excellence in uh, Europe. And uh, we do a lot of work with NVIDIA, looking at how we push GPU systems. Again, this is why we had this focus on GPU Direct, to really push the parallel scalability of a cluster, just to see how, how good you could make it if you really focus on this. And that's quite an interesting. There'll be some white papers coming out on the Dell website discussing this. Cambridge has a, a lot of activity currently on uh, genomics and as a central service provider within the university we have to focus on genomics and we're supporting a very large genomics project at the moment that has a task of sequencing 20,000 genomes over the next two years and all that workload is coming through our cluster and so we're having to, to really look at efficiency of those uh, next gen sequencing pipelines and it's actually quite challenging running a, a pipeline on a general purpose cluster. The pipeline tools do not, do not like schedulers. And so this has been quite challenging to get this working in a, in a multi-tenanted environment. But, but I think we're, we're kind of getting there. We have a, a five-year research project with Jaguar Land Rover. This is quite a successful project where we've got a long-term funding from Jaguar to help them look at their simulation capability because they have a very aggressive simulation roadmap and also then a data mining 
data management problem that what do they do with all that data so we're now just coming up to the end of the first year in this project and that's looking quite successful for Jaguar and for the university I think this is the last uh, the last kind of project slide so we have a long-term collaboration with uh, the South African Center so this is Happy Sitoli and his team we've been working with them now for six years really as a, a involved in co-design so we, we design our systems uh, together, we exchange staff, we're doing a lot of work now on HPC stack development. And of course this leads into the SKA work very well because South Africa will host a large component of the SKA and Happy's team will be probably involved in supporting that compute. So this kind of historical relationship with the South Africans is now proving very useful for SKA. Okay. So if we look at the, uh, the SKA project, I'm not sure what, what history you have on the project, so I'll start from the beginning. So it's, it's the next generation radio telescope. It has quite ambitious goals in terms of improvement in the, in the apparatus. So it, it, it aims to be 100 times more sensitive than the current world's best radio telescope and a million times faster at surveying the sky. So that's quite a kind of step function increase in radio astronomy capability. It will actually consist of five square kilometers of metal on the floor. So when you add up all these dishes and you add up the surface area, there'll be five square kilometers of dish spread over 3,000 kilometers of land mass. So it's a very large infrastructure, especially since they all have to be networked with lots of fiber. Okay, so this physical task of deploying this is, is uh, quite large I would say, especially when you look at the remote nature of the locations. It, it, it's kind of the next big science project in design and currently it's the world's most ambitious IT project and I would say it's the first kind of real life exascale ready application, although the applications don't exist yet, but anyway. It's the first application that needs exascale I would say. And it's, the, and it's a very large kind of global big data challenge. You have to use those words in the UK if you want money from the government, okay? <laughs> big data equals cash equals good. Okay. So if you look at the location of the SKA, it's kind of a continental sized radio telescope. Um, one component will be down here in the Karoo. And one component will be here in this very remote part of Australia. So you can see they, they, they really are far away from everything, which is obvious. Because mobile phones and radio telescopes do not go well together, apparently. So why are we bothering to do this radio telescope, apart from to keep HPC guys like me paid for the next 50 years? There is some science behind it, apparently. And uh, what, of course, what, what, what big telescopes allow you to do is as you look further away, in space, you're looking further back in time, okay? So when you can look a very long way back in, in, in space, you can look a long way back in time, and then kind of wind forward and look at how galaxies have evolved, okay? And map that onto your simulations. There's a particular part of cosmic evolution that my astronomers want to look at. They call it exploring the dark ages. Don't ask me, ask, a, ask an astronomer. Cosmic magnetism is another thing that this telescope will let us explore. It'll also be very good at mapping pulsars. So there's a specific set of applications the SKA will run to map pulsars. And pulsars obviously are very accurate clocks. And when you monitor all these accurate clocks, you can see distortions in them caused by gravity waves. So it can help you kind of explore the concept of gravity waves. And this is the one that gets my boy excited. Apparently, Daddy sa uh, my boy says Daddy's looking for aliens. I gave a talk to my boy's nine-year-old nine class last week. I could put that slide deck up. It's much more colourful. There's lots of green men walking over it. So we could swap if this gets boring. But uh, apparently, the, the SK will be able to look for kind of biomolecule signatures around planets. So if there's amino acids floating around some faraway planet, it might help you see those amino acids. But I think most importantly, and this is a slide that 
that my boss put in is that the SKA will allow us to investigate phenomena that we have not yet imagined. And this seems like a throwaway statement, but, it, but it's not, because it means that the compute infrastructure for the SKA has to be flexible. If we were to, if we were to design all the compute with ASICs that do one thing, it would be more efficient, but we would not be able to do this. Okay, so having a general purpose compute infrastructure that's programmable is very important if you take this statement seriously. Okay, this is a real kind of fundamental pivot point in the design of the system. If you want it to be as efficient as possible, you probably go and build an ASIC, right? Although that's a nightmare, obviously, we know that. But you might be tempted to go build ASICs. But then you wouldn't be able to do this. Okay, so this, this, this kind of thinking is important. It's not just slideware. So there is a timeline. The SK has been, has, has been mulled about for a long time, okay? So I think the, the discussion started in the mid-90s. Okay, and it's taken us all the way to 2012 before we actually started doing anything. But now we are firmly in the pre-construction phase, okay? And, and, it's, and it has a budget and the projects have kicked off. Okay, so this pre-construction phase is 2012 to 2016. Okay, so we're in that phase now. And actual construction should start somewhere. Phase one should start around 2017 to 2022. And then in 2022, we'll start building phase two. Phase one is only 10% of the experiment. Okay, and, we, and, and the budget is capped at 600. Oops. The budget is capped at 650 million. So if it turns out to be more expensive, it will just be a smaller experiment. Because this is the beauty of the SKA, you can just make it smaller if the money runs out. Okay. It is still useful as an, as, a, as, a, as an instrument. Well, is that 10% of the array or 10% of the computing that you're measuring? 10% of everything. There's no point in putting the array down if you can't analyze it. So 10% of the, of the total thing will be in place then. Okay. Okay. And this is kind of tractable, and you, and you can think about doing that, and it doesn't scare you too much. This is, is still relatively intractable in, in many aspects that we can come on to. Okay, obviously there's a structure, as you would imagine. There's an SKA board. There's a director. There's a project office. The project office is in Manchester, so it, you know, it has a very rigid uh, structure. The work packages are all being funded locally currently. Okay, so this is local funding that's doing the work under the direction of the project office in Manchester. There are many work packages, as you would imagine. The one we're going to talk about today is the, central, is the science data process. So that's what we're really interested in, I would guess, at this, at this conference. Obviously, there's a whole load of work in, in, in networks and signal transport as well, which would be interesting here, but we haven't got time to talk about it. So we're going to focus on the uh, science data processor. And that's being led by the UK. There's many organisations in this consortium. Okay. So... The science data processor really is a streaming data processing challenge. HPC guys need to get out of, of, of thinking about this as a large, you know, parallel processing batch processor that you submit jobs to. It's not like that. It's a streaming processor where very large data rates are streaming through the machine that have to be processed real time. Okay, so it's a it's a it's a streaming data handler, and that makes you think about it differently once you start to get your mind around that. Okay, it's been led by Paul Alexander, this work package at Cambridge University, so he's my boss in this context. And the design phase started at the end of last year. And we really need to build out this kind of multidisciplinary team of radio astronomers, HPC software guys, HPC hardware guys. And, and, and think about data delivery as well, you know, to the users, how do we get the data out and, and processed to do science. And there's, we built, Paul's built out a very large consortium of 11 countries. This might be incomplete and ch have changed, so uh, you can look on the website. So there's lots of, lots of different centres and, and many com companies also involved. Okay, this is just a list 
and this was correct as of a few months ago, but it may have changed. Okay, so it's just many, many organisations. And this is the work share. I'm sure this has changed by now. Every time I look at it, it's changed. There's a strong industrial element in the work, and a lot of time has been put into really trying to engage with industry to get industry on board in a productive uh, fashion. We can talk about that. There may well be some companies also that I've forgotten. It doesn't mean anything. It means I just forgot. Okay, so this, this slide tries to show some of the design. Again, very high level. We have dishes and antennas. This is the part we're really looking at here, which is a central data processor, and it shows to put on some of the data rates. This is phase two data rates. So you can see the data rates are, are high, but this is all feasible in terms of networking. It just starts to get a problem when you want to pump this amount of data through a system. Okay. And I think these, are, these numbers are, are remaining. As we baseline the system, these numbers are subject to change, and there will be a lot of baselining numbers coming out of the consortium shortly. We have developed a kind of a conceptual data flow in terms of tiering the data when, when it comes out of the experiment. So obviously there'll be some core facility in South Africa, some core facility in Australia, and that currently it is imagined that we will, this data will flow to regional archives for data storage and local compute, so that the astronomers will access these regional centres for deriving you know, knowledge from the data. They will not get access to facilities here. So the data will be tiered globally. So we developed this kind of conceptual model of the data processor some time back. And actually the SDP is looking at everything from the correlator this way. Okay, so our consortium is dealing with these components. And on here are some of the data rates and sizes of these elements. So this is phase one. This is phase two. And this gives an idea of the software complexity. Actually most of the budget we think for the SDP will be in the software, not in the hardware. And all the risk is in the software, I would say. So when you look at some of the numbers, this, this is tractable, we can, we can do this, okay? This is not too bad. This, this, this element here is a, is a fast buffer, so when, when the data streams into the STP, and we're doing those Fourier transforms, and you have to do Fourier transforms over an observational period, which is 12 hours, that all that data stream for those 12 hours needs to be buffered because you need to reanalyze that data. So this becomes quite a problem when you have these data rates and you need to store that 12 hours worth of that. Mm. So in real time. And then reiterate it. So this will prob probably be some kind of big flash cache, I would guess, of some large size. As I say, we can design this system now, and we have fantasy designs for this that are not too scary. This becomes more of a problem in the 2023, 2024 time frame. This is quite challenging, especially when you look at the power budgets in the desert, which are not very good. So power is the real... I, th I think, uh, actually, the SKA will be... The size of the experiment will be determined not by available budget, but by available power. It kind of is available budget in a way, but uh, available power is going to be the, the limiting factor, I think, on the SKA, because this is expensive in power. So, obviously, to kick the project off, we had to have some feasibility study that we could say, is this thing at all possible? And I'm not saying at all that the architecture is going to look like this at all, but we had to model it on something. Okay, so this is the architecture that we modelled to 
put into the RFI to say, is this thing at all even possible? Okay, so phase one has been modelled on an architecture like this, although it probably won't be like this when we get to build it. Okay, so it's a very traditional design of blades with SSDs, with some form of coprocessor, either GPU or mic. And you can do the normal thing HPC guys do and just come up with a elements and an architecture. And then you can answer numbers like how big is it, how much would it cost, how much power would it take, what's the environment that it needs to sit in. Right? So you can do those kinds of estimations based on something that's real today. And we've done that for the, SKA, for the SKA phase one, and we've built out the traditional kind of design that one would think of from a hardware perspective. Okay, and we come up with a bunch of numbers that we feed into the, to the design process. A similar exercise has been taken with, with the software stack. And there are conceptual elements that people are working on now. Okay, it's, it's reasonably traditional until you get up to here, then it starts to get a bit non-traditional. So, okay, so I'll, I'll delve down into some of the work packages that I'm running, and I can talk in more detail on. So, we've formed a, a function we're calling the Open Architecture Lab. Okay, and the, the function of the Architecture Lab is to provide a, a critical mass of HPC and astronomy knowledge combined with HPC equipment and lab staff to produce a shared resource for the SKA STP consortium for prototyping. And there's another work package in the SKA called COMP, which is a task of coming up with designs that we will test in the Open Architecture Lab. The COMP is being led out of Astron in the Netherlands. Okay, so the first function, headline function of the Open Architecture Lab is to provide a coordinated engagement mechanism with industry to drive these kind of platform development studies because it, the, the SDP is undertaking quite a strict um, system engineering approach where uh, candidate designs are produced we look at kind of small elements of them and then we test them iteratively with prototyping. Okay, so someone, some, some lab has to do that prototyping. So we're just bringing on board a, a dedicated project manager now to, to, to start to run this lab as a full-time entity. Obviously there'll be a lot of benchmarking that needs to be done on these prototypes that needs to be standardized across a whole different range of solutions so that we are comparing apples to apples and that data has to be reported back into comp We'll also manage a number of industry contacts. So, so a lot of our funding in the UK was to, to, was to be spent with industry so that we really engage industry in the process. So the UK government has been very mindful of trying to engage industry and our funding is specifically tagged to spend with industry. And we're going to, to drive a number of system studies okay, in, in a range of different areas. So kind of low level, it's kind of software raid luster performance testing. So we're really interested in driving the cost out of large luster inst installations. So we're, we're doing a lot of work looking at, you know, how low can we go in cost and how high can we go in performance in bulk luster. That project's already started. And we're working with Peter Brahms, the uh, founder of Luster, in that work. That's going quite well. We're also looking at large-scale archives. So once we produce the data and we have to store it for 50 years, how do we do that? So we're just producing some statement of work now. We'll be going to the market shortly looking for companies to work with us on archives. We're very interested in software-defined networking, so we can really think of network flows through the machine. Yeah, we can think, we're thinking of modeling the network with consumers and producers, defined by software networks, so that if we have failures, we can reroute things in, in the network. And so Chris Brookenhauer from uh, Astron has done a lot of work. Whoops, thank you. I'm very clumsy this morning. Chris Brookenhauer from Astron has done a lot of work with this already, so that's looking quite interesting. We're also quite interested in, in OpenStack in the HPC environment to try to leverage what's going on in the OpenStack world. So we're kicking off a project now with Cluster Vision 
from Holland again looking at OpenStack in the HPC environment. And we have another project in design looking at Slurm and seeing how we can integrate Slurm with the Telescope Manager. Because again, it's, you know, HPC guys will think of this as a cluster. It's not a cluster, it's a telescope. And there's an overall Telescope Manager. So there's, you know, there's local control of our element that will come from Slurm, but then there's much wider range control that comes from a Telescope Manager. And how you integrate Slurm as a telescope is, is quite challenging. But we don't, I don't want to have to write my own scheduler, right? so we have to adapt something. So currently we're looking at Slurm. The Open Architecture Lab will also build, as I say, prototype systems under the direction of COMP, so we're a service package for COMP. So we'll undertake system studies, again, directed by COMP. We have, we have dedicated staff doing this now. And we act as a managed lab for the comp work package and the wider SDP consortium. We have smart hands, we have equipment, and we just act as a service function for the rest of the, of the consortium. So, through all the work that the lab will do, there's an emphasis on testing scalable components, because obviously we can't build the real thing because we haven't got a billion dollars. So we have to, you know, componentize this process. And key considerations that we're looking at, obviously, are energy efficiency, scalable, cost-effective storage, because there's a lot of storage. Obviously, interconnects, because it's a data processor. The system software also is going to be challenging, as is how do we operate this thing? You know, how do we keep this thing working in the desert? With quite a high uptime. It's not... It's not like my HPC system in Cambridge that I can decide to turn off every Tuesday if I want to. Right. People will get nervous if this thing goes down often. So when you look at outputs from the lab, there's a whole range of outputs. Obviously, when you look at our industry work, we'll provide benchmark study papers, roadmap papers, and discussion digests that we feed to the rest of the consortium. We'll build and test platforms, again, with papers. And we're a service function, so service is the output. So there's a whole range of different outputs in papers, discussion studies, and just service function. Okay, so if you look at the organisation of, of the lab, it's coordinated by Cambridge, but it's jointly run also with the CHPC in South Africa, so it's kind of combined management of the operations. There's dedicated project manager, there's dedicated HPC engineers and lab staff, and there's a range of other labs that are contributing that all have to be, con that all have to be organized. I'll start to skip over some of these. So we have a whole, a whole range of different test beds, okay. Lots of small systems, fire, um, atom. We are, it's been agreed that we'll become a, an Intel IPCC for radio astronomy, looking at how we port applications to Intel architecture. We have a lot of test beds on Lustre because this is the work package we started first. So we're quite far advanced on the file system work. We Lustre on commodity hardware with hardware RAID, Lustre on commodity hardware with software RAID. This is under test at the moment. This is looking actually quite interesting. So we can dramatically increase the performance and decrease the cost with software RAID. Um, we have a target in mind here of being able to deliver 70% of the performance of the spinning disk to the file system and having 70% of the cost of the solution being disk. So when you're getting those kinds of numbers, there's not much room for optimization anymore. Okay, kind of 70% of the performance is getting to the file system and 70% of the cost is a spinning disk. We can stop working on that because that's done. We're also looking at ZFS, which is quite interesting. A lot of work going on with Seth. And so we're having discussions with vendors on archives. So this is reasonably well advanced at the moment. That's, that's, that's going quite well. And we have around four FTEs working on that at the moment. 
We're going to be developing quite a lot of networking test beds of, of different hardware, really focused on software-defined networks and focusing on RDMA transfer between the coprocessors. You know, how can you get that data in and out of those coprocessors efficiently? We'll be building out several Slurm test beds and OpenStack test bed. Okay, so we'll just talk about the last work package. So obviously this thing has to be operated and operating an exascale compute platform in the desert at a remote facility is going to be quite challenging. When you look at where the world's kind of largest HPC infrastructures are held today, they're normally in some government lab. There's a lot of infrastructure around that government lab. They've got a long history of doing that, so all the processes and the infrastructures and the logistics are, are well practiced in those locations. If you want to start all that up in the desert from nothing, that's quite challenging. Okay, because there's no experience, there's no processes, and there's no infrastructure. So this part of the SKA is actually quite, quite challenging because you know, when deployed, the SDP will, will be one of the largest HPC systems in existence at that time. It'll probably be around five times the physical size of, of Titan in Oak Ridge. So if you go to Oak Ridge and you see these machines, right, they're, they're impressive. And you times, you times that by five in terms of physical infrastructure, and that's quite scary. Okay, those guys at Oak Ridge know what they're doing. They've been doing it for a long time. And they have all the infrastructure there. If you, if you want to suddenly transplant that and put it in the desert, that's, that's quite difficult. Although it, it is tractable if one thinks about it. So when you look at operations, I won't go through this list, but I'm just going to, I'm just going to focus on some of the operational aspects that, that are interesting in this context. So obviously the machine room is, 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 is the first challenge, to build a big machine room in the desert, because now if you're build, building large machine rooms, you're probably going to use water in there and want some kind of um, compressorless cooling. That becomes tricky if there's no water. I don't, think that, I don't think I'm going to be able to be evaporating lots of water out there. The high temperature anyway makes these kinds of uh, compressorless cooling things tricky. Okay. Also the air is very dry, which is not good for humidification. In fact the temperature range is quite high externally, so again that's a problem. And the remote location makes maintenance logistics quite tricky. Okay. So we have, to, we have to work really hard thinking about the data centre. Although the baselines are stretching now, so maybe we won't have to have the machine room in the, in the desert. There is talk about moving them back to, to more sensible centres of population. So that this slide may become irrelevant if that baseline changes. Because one has to tension power and networking costs. Okay, and this is the struggle at the moment within the SKA, is looking at these tensions of power and network costs and location. You don't have to have the compute next to the antennas. You could, you could move it somewhere else. Obviously, system software is also a, an interesting challenge. Having 100,000 elements being controlled by some kind of software stack is a challenge, although obviously the HPC community is looking at this. There's a lot of work going on on exascale system software, and we can learn from that community. But I think I'm more interested in the non-HPC communities, actually. You know, Google and Amazon and Facebook kind of do this today. They run hundreds of thousands of elements, and they control it, and they manage it. And, and we have a much broader community to work from. So I, we will look to the HPC community, but actually I'm more focused on, on looking to the non-HPC community, especially with OpenStack, on how we can build scalable system software to run this thing. <coughs> Obviously maintenance logistics, as I touched on, will be tricky. You know, many of us here have experience of running you know, 600 nodes. We know the kind of failures we get on 600 nodes in a week, and a couple of good engineers can deal with that. That's okay. But when you scale that up to 100,000 nodes, then you're getting you know, 300 failures a week. This becomes tricky. Now, how do you deal with 300 failures a week in the, in the desert? How do you diagnose them? How do you keep on top of it? So we really need to start thinking about automation of failure detection. Obviously, the system has to be designed to handle that. So the, the, the application software has to be tolerant to you know, tens of failures a day. 
and we need, uh, and in, in the software design for the SKA, this is one of the of the of the key drivers of that software design is it to be fault tolerant. But even still, even if it's fault tolerant, in the end you have to fix those nodes, otherwise you end up with no nodes. Right? And just fixing them at that rate is, is quite tricky business. And then in terms of operations, the last slide, y you have to talk about staffing levels and training because finding the staff to, to work and operate this system in the desert is not going to be easy. I can't find staff in Cambridge. Right, how am I going to find staff in the bloody Karoo? You know, it's, it's tricky, right? The kind of inducements I have to do to get good staff to come to Cambridge drives me mad. Free beer, everything. I can't get... I can't, I can't. It cost me a fortune. My wife was always complaining about the, my beer bill on a Friday night. That I have to keep my staff happy. I couldn't give them enough staff to go and work in the Karoo. Yeah. enough beer to go and work in the career right? So this is a problem. And again, this is why OpenStack becomes interesting, because you have a wider staff pool. You know, the less niche we make the operations of this thing, the better. And this has to be designed in from the start. You have to be thinking about this in the design, otherwise we have a problem. And this is the last slide. This is quite interesting. In Cambridge, we love harking back to our history, because it's wonderful and magnificent. And this is one of our nice historical kind of loops. So this guy here is Morris Wilkes. He designed this machine here called Ed's, EDZAC, which was the first system to have electronic memory. The electronic memory is this vat of mercury that they seem quite happily leaning over. They're both dead now, obviously. <laughs> and this probably has something to do with it. But this machine was quite kind of seminal when it was created, and it was created for radio astronomy purposes. So this was a, a machine a cutting-edge machine that was created in Cambridge for radio astronomy you know, back in the day, and now today we're doing something similar with the SKA, which is a nice historical uh, loop. And that's it. Any questions for Paul? So in one sense, so this has been done before, um, in the sense that... <laughs> We formed this uh, big uh, worldwide network to analyze data coming from scientific experiments. And yeah. Thinking about the large hadron collider mm. concern, and are there any particular lessons from that which you've been able to apply, or which you don't think? I mean, obviously you've got way different challenges. Yeah. Being in, in the desert, remote areas, and things, time scale. But is there anything there that, that you learned or picked up that was helpful? Yeah. So, I think the commoditization that they've gone through there, yes, in the way that they're really driving commodity infrastructures and of course they're now looking at OpenStack as well on their infrastructure so there are some parallels although the, the one primary difference between the SKA and the CERN work is that all of the processing to produce the primary data products will be done at the telescope and then those data products will be shipped around the world for further processing whereas in CERN of course the data products that work is done in a distributed way. So there are some there are some fundamental differences between the workflow between CERN and and the SKA. Although yes, I mean the CERN guys have got a lot of experience of building large infrastructure and running a worldwide network. So we're talking to them a lot. Okay. How much intelligence if any is in the collector to reduce the data set? How much intelligence is in the network? Is in the collector. Oh, in the collector, lots. There's a, there's lots of data reduction going on. Uh, so there there is a lot of compute actually in the uh, in the antennas. But I I don't talk about that because it's not my work package and I can't think about it. But there is there is a lot going on there. There's a lot of data reduction going on at all stages. In in the antennas, it's ASICs, it's FPGAs and dedicated uh, silicon. Um, the risk register around this must be horrendous. Yep. Because you've pointed a huge number of challenges. How the hell do you manage that risk register in the sense that the funding agencies stay vaguely comfortable? You want to talk with the project office in Manchester. That's what they do. They have 80 people there. 80? Yeah. There's 80 people in the project office. And I would think a fair number of them are dealing with risk. And it, it is very tightly managed. 
Okay, so as a, as a project, I, I run two work packages, and if you see the number of JIRA tickets that I have to deal with on project reports, that I'm late on. Okay, so it's, we are all very tightly managed, so it's very formal, there's monthly status reports with running risk registers, and it's very, the project office are really very tightly managing the system. Okay. Miles Deegan is the project manager now for the STP in Manchester. So, uh, you know Miles, so go and ask Miles, he's, uh, he's doing that. The of the yeah, I think so. <laughs> Last question. Okay, thank you.